Right, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear guests, welcome to tonight's additional meeting of our Foreign Affairs Committee. We come to point one of our agenda. We have to adopt the agenda. I guess nobody has any comments. Um, today's interpretation regime you may speak and listen to French, German, Italian, English, Spanish, and Polish. You may also speak, but not listen to Dutch. The second point, for reason of internal organization, we have to close this meeting definitely at 9 o'clock. We have two parts of this meeting. First, with our guest of honor, and then we will have an additional point on the current situation in Ukraine. We come to item number two, Chair's announcements. There were none at the time of drafting. Any from your side? Any advice if that's not the case? Then we come to already point three. Mr. Torbjorn Jagland, once again, welcome to our Foreign Affairs Committee. Mr. Jagland is the Secretary General of the Council of Europe. Um, you've been a frequent guest in our committee. The last time you were with us was in May last year. We agreed to have you as a guest in our committee a few weeks ago when we had a bilateral meeting here in Strasbourg. The advantage is that Mr. Jagland doesn't have far to walk to this parliament, it just has to cross the road. Um, we in this Foreign Affairs Committee, as you know, Mr. Secretary General, we know that the Council of Europe plays a key role in the security architecture of Europe together with the OSCE. We in this parliament believe that the EU and especially the European Parliament and the Council of Europe complement each other and we should work together avoiding overlaps and unnecessary competition. Last month, Secretary General Yagland visited Turkey. He met President Erdogan, he met the Foreign Minister, he met the EU Affairs Minister, he met the Speaker of the Parliament, the President of the Constitutional Court, and opposition party representatives. So perhaps you could tell us a bit about your impressions in Ankara of these meetings and areas where we could re-engage and find a common positive agenda in order to overcome the standoff during recent times. Perhaps you could also brief us on the recent developments in the Council of Europe as concerns Russia and Ukraine, as well as the situation in Azerbaijan. There are many, many other issues we would like to discuss with you. I would suggest that we will now have time till round about half past eight for a discussion with you. So you have the floor. Once again, welcome to your neighbors in the European Parliament. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to be here again uh, with a good neighbor. I think it's very important now that the uh, Council of Europe and um, the European Union works hand in hand. We, have done, we, are, we are doing that uh, indeed. Uh, and uh, I would... Um, gladly uh, give some um, assessment about the situation in Turkey and what the Council of Europe is doing and can do to influence the situation there. It's true I went to, to Turkey some weeks ago mainly to discuss two things, namely the functioning of the commission that we helped set up to deal with all the applications um, or the complaints from all the dismissed people, more than 100,000 people, uh, and uh, then also to uh, discuss with the Constitutional Court, which is supposed to play a very important role in Turkey. I will come back to th this and to underline how important it is now that um, uh, Turkey applies rule of law and in particular that they respect the rulings of the Constitutional Court and the Constitutional Court can continue to play an independent and impartial role in Turkey. Now, before I come to this, I would like to say that um, 
we have a very good record in Turkey during the years since the 1970s. The court has, dealt, has handed down some 9,600 judgments. Um, and many of these judgments against the, the, the Turkish state and many of these judgments, of course, contributed to this case law that the European Court of Human Rights has and also contributed to international human rights law in the field of torture, killings, disappearances, freedom of expression, village destruction, um, expropriation of property, and so on. Um, and at one point, when the overcourt here in Strasbourg was dealing with so many judgments from, from, from Turkey that the Turkish authorities themselves said that the European Court of Human Rights has established itself as the constitutional court of Turkey. And this actually led to a very important uh, historic, I would say, um, achievement in Turkey, namely that the, constitu that the um, constitutional court of Turkey was established uh, based on a law saying that all Tur Turks should have the right to go to this constitutional court and that the constitutional court should rule on the basis of the European Convention and the case law of the European Court, which meant then that Turkey itself took over the responsibility for applying the European Convention on Turkish soil. And this was a major step forward uh, in Turkey and the Constitutional Court during the years after it was established in 2012 has handed down a number of landmark decisions and helped uh, so many people, in individuals uh, in Turkey. So um, I say this because it must be understood how the European Convention is functioning, namely that the state parties to the Convention, they have the responsibility for applying the Convention at the domestic level in the first place. The European Court is not there to replace the judiciary in our member states. On the contrary, uh, the domestic courts shall uh, have an obligation to apply the, the Convention at the domestic level. So this is the first order uh, principle in, um, which uh, is stated in Article 35, uh, one uh, in the European Convention, namely that the European Court of Human Rights shall not deal with complaints where domestic remedies have not been exhausted. And this is very important to understand the, the, what we can do in Turkey. This is why, for instance, the first thing we did after the attempted coup was to say to the Turkish authorities that um, what they did with regard to dismissal of all these people, more than 100,000 people, was actually unlawful because they became guilty per se in the law. They were dismissed in the law and therefore they didn't have any judicial remedy at the domestic level in Turkey. So we said you have to establish a domestic remedy for all these people. That's why this commission came about and this commission is now dealing with all the complaints from the dismissed people. This is not a judicial body, actually, but it is, one can say, it's a kind of preparatory commission. And after uh, all the complaints have gone through this commission, all the individuals have the right to go to Turkish courts, and it opens up for an avenue to the European Court of Human Rights. And um, the European Court said that this is, uh, till, it, uh, till the opposite has been proven, uh, that uh, this is a domestic remedy. But the Court has also said that um, it will make judgments whether it is uh, an effective, impartial domestic remedy. Um, and, uh, but that can only be judged when they have um, uh, 
um, individual applications to the European Court of Human Rights. So I say this because I've seen that many or some have has said that the Council of Europe should have said immediately after the attempt to coup that um, uh, the judiciary was no longer independent and impartial and therefore all people could go directly to the European Court of Human Rights. It couldn't because the Convention says clearly and we have to apply the Convention and which means that we apply the rule of law of ourselves, namely that one has to exhaust the domestic remedy first and then one can go to the European Court of Human Rights. So what we did with establishing this commission is actually that we uh, gave people the possibility to go to, through the judiciary in Turkey and uh, European Court as a last resort. Now, the situation is I met with the Euro this commission, the president of this commission. It has uh, now 107,000 uh, applications, which means, of course, that they have a very heavy burden. They go through each and every application. They say that they are, for the time being, they deal with 600 per week, which can be increased to 1,000 per week. So they are working as speedily as they can. Uh, and, um, uh, well, I, I, I cannot tell you how long time this process will take, but, but obviously uh, they are working um, uh, uh, as fast as such a commission is able to work and whether this proves to be a real domestic remedy that remains to be seen but it can only be judged by the European Court of Human Rights nobody else can intervene in this so it goes to the court and the over court will make an, uh, a judgment if necessary and then over court can take a pilot judgment and make this um, judgment. Now, my second task in Turkey was to say to the Turkish leaders that they have to respect the constitutional court, which they themselves established in order to uh, take uh, responsibility for the European Convention at the domestic level. And the background was actually um, uh, also, I mean, a very concrete background for the, my going there and to say this to the Turkish authorities, namely that the, there was some, um, uh, some uh, hesitation whether the Constitutional Court would continue to uh, uh, act as an independent uh, judicial source after the attempted coup. Uh, and rightly so, one could say, because two of the judges uh, were dismissed after the, uh, after the coup. Uh, but um, uh, as, you have, as you saw, the Constitutional Court handed down uh, a ruling uh, related to two of the very well-known journalists saying that they should be released. They were in pre-trial detention. Constitutional Court said that they would should be released, but the lower courts refused to release them. Uh, so they upheld the, the first judgments. And uh, therefore, many were worried that the Constitutional Court would not be respected by the lower courts and the authorities. And uh, this is a very important uh, point for us now, namely to, uh, be, because if the Constitutional Court decisions will not be respected, then, of course, all those who have complained to the Constitutional Court, those, for instance, the many journalists that are in jail, they will then go directly to the European Court of Human Rights. And the Court of Human Rights will then deal with these applications if of a court comes to the conclusion that the Constitutional Court is no, no longer an effective remedy because their, their judgments are not respected in, German, in Turkey. And um, uh, I have been informed that um, uh, many of the journalists have already complained to the European Court, and uh, the first judgments from the European Court will be handed down on the 20th of March. It relates to two of these well-known uh, journalists. 
So this will be an important uh, point in uh, now um, uh, when we are talking about uh, whether the European Convention uh, is able to keep Turkey within the, the boundaries of rule of law. Uh, and, uh, but it remains to be seen uh, how this uh, turns out. But one, you can be sure that the European Court of Human Rights will be totally independent, impartial, and base its rulings all, only on the uh, ca case law it has uh, itself established and, of course, the European, co uh, European Convention. So I, what I, my message to you is the following. We have to apply the convention, which is and, uh, the fundamental article in the convention, namely first, everybody has to exhaust domestic remedy, but the European Court of Human Rights will make a judgment whether the judiciary in Turkey is independent. If not, then, of course, the European Court will take over the whole show. And this is how the convention ha was meant to, to function, namely that it is a last resort court and not a court which can take over the responsibility for the domestic remedy, uh, for the dom uh, domestic uh, uh, judiciary. Um, so, um, uh, I would say that um, if you look at the record that uh, the Council of Europe has in Turkey and what the European Court has done during the years, I would say that this is now the most effective instrument that Europe has to keep uh, Russia within uh, certain boundaries uh, of rule of law and uh, human rights, but of course also the European Union uh, has to play its role, uh, but together we may be, uh, uh, we may be uh, in a position to influence developments there. We have also other instruments like the Venice Commission that has handed down a number of opinions with regard to um, uh, Turkish laws, in particular those are related to freedom of expression. We have the Human Rights Commissioner that has uh, paid some 37 fact-finding missions to Turkey during the years and has also been able to influence um, uh, developments there in a, a good uh, way. Now, uh, Mr. President, coming to, to, to Russia. Um, also there, I would like to And this goes also with regard to Turkey and to, to explain the role of the Council of Europe and the European Convention. We are not set up to, in, to replace a government, to raise, replace a parliament, to replace uh, a, po um, a public um, who is um, voting for the parliament and uh, so on. So, but we are there to protect individual rights. So we, we do not have a, a say on what kind of regime or government they have in Turkey or Russia in an, any other member state. We are there to protect individual rights against arbitrary power in other member states. And if you judge over action in Russia on that background, I would say it has been quite successful. There, and there has been significant improvement in the execution of our court's judgments in Russia. Over 500 cases have been closed over the last two years. And if you look at it in the longer perspective, the judgment of the court, the European court against Russia, has moved legislation in Russia in the right direction during all the years. Um, so therefore we can say that today um, the uh, Russian courts are applying the European Convention in a much more ap effective way than it did 10 or 20 years ago. 
Um, and there has been considerable improvements in, for instance, the penitentiary system in, in Russia. Just to explain to you how this is, I mean, because of the judgments of the court, um, because there were so many uh, complaints from uh, uh, inmates, pr prisoners in, in Russia to the court, then the court has handed down so many judgments uh, against the Russian state for uh, conditions in the prisons. And also the Commission for Prevention of Torture, Torture has visited the prisons time and again and discussed with Russian authorities. And this has uh, led to an inconsiderable improvement in uh, prisons in, in, uh, in Russia. For instance, when the Soviet Union broke down, there were one million prisoners in Russian prisons, in Stalin-like prisons in, uh, in Russia. Today, the number of um, uh, uh, inmates in Russian prisons are 175,000. It tells a lot about the achievements that we have done in Russia because of the role of the court and because of the work of the CPT, uh, Commission for Prevention of Torture, and the Human Rights Commissioner, the Parliamentary Assembly, and all the instruments that Council of Europe has in its hand. Now, there is a huge crisis with regard to Turkey uh, because of Russia. It started with the illegal annexation of Crimea, which was outrageous, which we couldn't do anything about, and it is not overall to solve it, I would say. But nevertheless, the Parliamentary Assembly made a decision right after the annexation that the Russian delegation should not have the right to vote in the Parliamentary Assembly. I can understand that this happened at the time, but now it is causing problems for the organization and the functioning of the whole convention system because uh, the Parliamentary Assembly is electing the judges to the court, is electing the Human Rights Commissioner, and, we, and will elect my successor in one and a half year time. And as the Russian delegation is not able to vote, this is, of course, affecting the legitimacy, they say, to these bodies, to the European Court uh, and the Human Rights Commission. And if the Secretary General is being elected without their votes, of course, it, it, it causes problems. Therefore, they have stopped financing the Council of Europe. They stand for 10% of the budget. And um, if this crisis goes on, it will, of course, affect the um, possibilities for us to work uh, Europe-wide, but also at the end in, in, in Russia itself, because we cannot have a member state that is not financing the organization. And they say we cannot be a member in an organization where we cannot elect the highest officials, and in particular the judges to the court. Um, so, therefore, we need to find a way out of this uh, crisis. If not, there is a danger that um, Russia will fall out of the convention, um, which would be very, very bad for Russian citizens, and, as I see it, also very bad for Europe as a whole. Because uh, if Russia is not a member of the Council of Europe, then 145 million people will be deprived of the rights to, uh, uh, to apply to the European uh, Court. And as the Court has played such an important role for European citizens, you know, for Russian citizens during the years, this will, of course, be a huge setback for the Russian uh, society. And again, one has to keep in mind that we are not there for the state. We are there for the people. The European Convention is about people's right to complain against their own state. So if a state falls out of the convention, then the citizens do not have the right to make complaints against their own state. And for Europe, uh, the big question is whether uh, we would be better off if, Turk if uh, Russia falls out of the convention, which is the only place where Russia is um, connected to Europe in a formal 
judicial way? Would it be a better Europe? Or is it better for us to keep them in uh, and keep the legal space that goes from Vladivostok to Lisbon, from the high north to the south Caucasus? I would say that it would be a tragic um, development if uh, Russia is not part of this common legal space, which we achieved to have established after the fall of the Soviet Union. But of course, everything has its price, and the price cannot be, of course, that we uh, accept the illegal annexation of Crimea. Uh, but having said this, it is not up to the Council of Europe to solve this crisis. Uh, we are doing a lot for Ukraine, and that will be my last point. We have uh, uh, recently adopted a new action plan for Ukraine. We have some 50 people on the ground in Kiev to help uh, the Vekon of Rada with new legislation, constitutional matters, uh, reform of the judiciary, fighting corruption, decentralization, and all this, and again, also the um, uh, citizens of Ukraine enjoys the right to go to the European Court of uh, Human Rights, so it is equally important, of course, that Ukraine is also a part of our uh, family. And I, my view is that, it, that um, uh, Ukraine would be better off also and probably safer if uh, their big neighbor, Russia, would stay uh, in the convention um, itself. So these are the, the three uh, main issues on over, uh, Azerbaijan, another thing. We have had a person in prison for nearly five years now, uh, despite the fact that the court has said that he should be released. And uh, this is why the Committee of Ministers, with, which has the obligation to implement judgment from the court, there is a collective responsibility of the Committee of Ministers to see to it that judgments of the court uh, is implemented. This is why the com this Committee of Ministers has now decided to ask the European Court whether Azerbaijan is in compliance with the European Convention. It has, it, that's never happened before that the uh, Committee of Ministers has taken certain action and applying uh, Article 46.4 of the Convention. So it was an historic event. Since this is now in the court, I will, not, uh, I will refrain from uh, commenting on it because now it will be up to the court to have the final word there. Uh, and I, I will... Um, sum up by uh, saying that what we are doing now in Turkey, Russia, Azerbaijan, Ukraine, shows how the European Convention was uh, meant to function, namely that it is the last resort for European citizens. We have, in the first place, to get our member states to apply the Convention at the domestic level and everybody has to exhaust the uh, possibility uh, of uh, complaining to the domestic courts, and only after that they can go to the European Court. And only if we apply this in a very strict manner, we are able to influence developments in these countries, as well as, uh, of course, all the other countries on this uh, continent. So I thank you very much, and I'm uh, looking forward to uh, any question which you may have. Thank you. Right, thank you, Mr. Jagland, for your remarks. Um, colleagues, I have the following of you who would like to say something. Ms. Piri, Mr. Binefe, Ms. Moody, Mr. Weigel, Ms. Lochbieler. Anyone missing? Ms. Andikine and Ms. Sofko. Okay, then I would suggest that we do one round of colleagues. Please keep it as brief as possible because we only have 25 minutes left. And we start with 
the EPP, Ms. Andikini. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, uh, when speaking about Russia, you started by mentioning illegal annexation of Crimea. And as a consequence, that Russia lost its voting right in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Pressing on the Council of Europe in, in order to have its voting right restored, Russia cuts, uh, cut its financial contribution. I think you shouldn't, we, we shouldn't feel sorry about this. Because the, the, the reason, the real reason we all know is annexation of Crimea and military actions of Russia in uh, Eastern Ukraine. So when you speak that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem and we might have uh, you know, other problems as the consequence of, uh, of the situation, I think it's very convenient for Russia to have the, the, the situation like it looks now and they know what they have to do they have to withdraw from Crimea and they have to withdraw from Eastern Ukraine. And that is it. Don't you think so? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Andikine. Now we come to Ms. Piri from the SND. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, Secretary General Yagland, for, for coming here. Um, we all uh, envy, I mean, we don't envy you with a lot of headaches uh, within the Council of Europe. Um, let me, let me focus on Turkey, a couple of questions. You already um, said some things in your introductions. On the Committee of Inquiry, um, the information I got is that the decisions are not public. Is this correct? And do you, you mentioned the number of uh, people that apply to this committee, but do you also know how many decisions have already been taken? Um, I don't have to explain to you that for now, by 18 months, People who were fired are left without any social security, uh, unemployed, in a very, very big misery. So the longer this lasts, the more difficult it will get for them. On the Constitutional Court, I think you raised it because this is of huge concern that the Constitutional Court uh, of Turkey makes a decision which is not being implemented. Um, there is a Venice Commission um, um, opinion on the implications also of the new constitution inside Turkey, which was put up for a referendum, where of course the constitutional court is even under more political control. What, will, what kind of effect will uh, this have uh, for Turkey's membership in, inside uh, the Council of Europe? Then on the European Court of Human Rights, of course it's an independent court, but the last 18 months it didn't make any judgments which uh, were not liked by Ankara. The first judgment will probably be on the 20th of March. Uh, do you have any indications whether it will be implemented? And let me ask, because I see the chair with his hammer, um, let me then pick which of the last three questions to ask. Um, let me ask you this. After all these intensive um, uh, relations between various organs of the Council of Europe, you yourself and Turkey, has there been any organ of the Council of Europe which has asked for a meeting with the politicians, the mayors, or the journalists in jail? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Piri. Mr. Weigel for the Alder Group. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Yaglan, I think it is extremely important that we are exchanging uh, views and uh, positions with, uh, with, uh, with the Council of Europe. I indeed agree with your assessment that we, the Council of Europe is important because this is the only place where all these problematic countries, let me put that way, are, are participating on one or another way. So I share your concern about the, about the dilemma, how to not to break completely the, the relations with Turkey, with, with, with Russia and with some other countries who are, who are in, uh, violating not only human rights, but especially, especially international law. So uh, the case of Russia and Ukraine is not alone in, in the world politics. We have, we have, we have uh, uh, 
similar situations with, with uh, Morocco occupying Western Sahara, with, uh, with Israel violating the principles of international law in Palestine. We have uh, Armenia uh, uh, occupying Nagorno-Karabakh. Nagorno so we, I understand you are dealing with uh, with uh, part of, of this problematic and the rest or the other uh, is our problem or a problem of United Nations and, 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 and international fora like, like, uh, like the courts. And, but there is a common denominator. There is more and more uh, violations of international law in the world and there are less and less problems who have been resolved in last, last 20 years. So this makes me worried. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lochbieder for the Greens. Thank you. Thank you also for your statement. And maybe also to let you know that your uh, Human Rights Commissioner, Mr. Musniak, made a very good statement to mark the International Women's Day when he was addressing us in plenary in Brussels. Now on Turkey, I think some of us who have been in Ankara in 2012-13 shared your analysis that uh, the ordinary citizens of Turkey benefited a lot of the rich case law, which was translated very well by the Ministry of Justice into Turkish law. But now the situation, and you said the Turkish leadership has to respect the constitutional court, and that remains to be seen. Could you reflect a little bit on your impressions? And a final question now. Um, here we discuss the financial framework for the next legislature and it looks like that there will be huge cuts in our budget. Have you discussed in your organization how this will reflect on <laughs> the contributions to you? Thank you. Vielen Dank, Frau Lochbieler. Second round. The last three speakers, Ms. Sofko for the EPP. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, here I am. I would like to continue with this question on Turkey and its right to exercise their political guidance in the Balkans. Uh, we have an issue in Bosnia and Herzegovina on uh, election law. And we have a Turkey as a member of Peace Implementation Council. And recently, High Representative has said that if there is no agreement, he will be um, probably advised to uh, impose some measures uh, in order to not to have a stalemate in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Do you think that Turkey that is breaching so many rights um, can uh, be somebody who will give political guidance on European issue? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Benefei. Grazie Presidente, brevemente vorrei solo eh, fare due considerazioni. Intanto un eh, ringraziamento al Segretario Generale Jagland per essersi eh, eh, presentato qua con noi per questo eh, confronto, in quanto eh, da parlamentare europeo eh, italiano sono assolutamente eh, convinto eh, dell'importanza eh, dell del lavoro del Consiglio d'Europa, perché l'ho potuto vedere in questi anni nel mio eh, Paese, eh, membro sia dell'Unione Europea che del Consiglio d'Europa, in particolare sulla cooperazione riguardante lo sviluppo delle riforme penitenziarie, dell'ordinamento giudiziario, eh, l'adesione la, eh, a protocolli importanti, penso a ehm, quello addizionale sulla convenzione sul trasferimento delle persone condannate eh, giusto ancora il 20 eh, di febbraio, ma penso anche all'azione sulla frode, eh, eh, la convenzione sul eh, contrasto alle frodi nei beni culturali. Insomma, un campo molto ampio che riguarda i diritti umani, eh, i diritti delle persone e eh, il mio Paese ha potuto fare dei passi avanti anche per questo 
forte collaborazione, in particolare penso eh, con, il, a, con il Ministro eh, Orlando. Eh, ma dall'altra parte eh, vorrei eh, come seconda considerazione eh, ag agganciarmi a quello che eh, ehm, veniva eh, detto anche da altri colleghi sul fronte della necessità di essere molto rigorosi nel momento in cui ci rapportiamo a Paesi come Turchia, e Russia e non solo, che eh, possono utilizzare sicuramente il marchio di far parte di questo organismo, ma devono eh, rispettare alcune eh, eh, necessità, alcuni requisiti per poter continuare a far parte del Consiglio d'Europa. Credo nel caso, che nel caso della Turchia le questioni già poste dalla collega Piri siano state già molto, molto chiare. Grazie. Grazie. And finally, Claire Moody. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Secretary General Jagland, for coming to speak with us this evening. Uh, two points. One is um, I happen to live in a small city in England that nobody had heard of 10 days ago uh, called Salisbury. <laughs> and we uh, recently have seen that uh, there are now, well, now three people to, uh, who came from Russia who are uh, seriously ill as a consequence of nerve agent and that, that came from Russia as well. So I think it's following on from comments that have been made elsewhere that, and the, yeah, the news today that there has been an asset, this being ascribed to Russian activity, that you know, there are concerns about what Russia are doing currently with whatever relationship with the Council of Europe. So I think it, we need to reflect on that. And also looking at the individual rights that you talked about, you know, there are grave concerns about the rights of people from the LGBT community in uh, Russia as well, and I'd welcome your comments on that. My second question relates to the announcement last week in, uh, on International Women's Day and of the gender equality perspective that, uh, program that was announced as well and what you regard as being the highlight of the work that is intended in the uh, 2018 to 21 work program. Thank you. Right, thank you, Claire Moody. A number of questions, Mr. Jagland, and you have 11 minutes to try and answer them all. Uh, let me just make one remark, because we were talking about Russia and Azerbaijan. Um, in both countries, elections or so-called elections will take place. The European Parliament has decided not to send any official observers, and none of our colleagues have the right uh, to give declarations on behalf of the European Parliament should they travel to one of the two countries. Thank you for the many questions. They are very important. First, I would like to say to Mrs. Kinney, uh, I can understand how you are feeling about the annexation of Crimea and the interference in um, eastern Ukraine and Donbass. Uh, and I, have to, I too have strong feelings about it. It was an outrageous act by Russia. However, it is not up to the Council of Europe to solve the, the crisis. Actually, it is the Security Council of the UN that has the role to secure um, peace and stab stability in the world. Uh, and the uh, other role is to secure the rights of the individuals, regardless of the situation. Uh, so, We cannot say that, like you said, that we should be happy for the fact that Russia is uh, now um, about to leave the Council of Europe or has been deprived of the right to vote in parliamentary assembly. I am not at all happy for it because it will affect 145 million people. So I'm thinking about the people. This is my role. I'm defending people's rights. 
and if these people do not have the right to go to the European Court, which uh, so many have done during the years and which have affected, influenced legislation and practices, the penitentiary, they do not have death penalty. I mean, one has to have a little bit of a historic perspective on what we are talking about. If you look at the convention, there are four uh, very important articles in the convention which can never be derogated. Article two, which means that we cannot have death penalty. Article three, torture is totally banned. Article four, we cannot have forced labor. And Article seven, we cannot, cannot have uh, punishment without law. And this is a huge achievement of Europe, that we have a continent of 800 million people where we don't have death penalty, we don't have torture, we, we cannot have um, forced labor, and we cannot have uh, punishment without law. And I want to preserve this legal space. We, we do not have it in any other part of the world. Not in America, they have death penalty. So, I mean, I'm thinking about the people on this continent. And we cannot, the Council of Europe cannot be involved in all kinds of geopolitical struggles because it's not overall to solve them. We have to stick to our mandate. Now, uh, Mr. Piri uh, uh, asked uh, many relevant questions about Turkey. The decision, the decision of the commi this special commission, they should be public. Um, they have started to hand down the de decisions. Some people, not too many, unfortunately. Uh, well, I cannot make a judgment on that. This is for our court to judge at the end of the day. Some have been reinstalled, got the jobs back. Uh, others have been uh, rejected. They are dealing with 600 cases each week, uh, each month, uh, increasing um, up to 1,000. We do not know uh, exactly now whether the Commission will hand down decisions based on the European Convention. If not, over court will intervene. The alternative would have been much worse because if these people had applied directly to the over court, which I did, then the, the only thing the court could have said is that uh, they could have uh, make a, they would have made a judgment saying that Turkey had to establish a domestic remedy, and we have, would have lost at least two years because the, the over court has to apply the convention; it cannot overlook the the article in the convention which says that they cannot deal with any application before one has exhausted a domestic remedy. So we cannot say to Turkey, please apply rule of law, and we do not reply, uh, apply rule of law in our own system. Um, uh, the new constitution, and it's true that the uh, there is a danger that the, Const new Constitu the new Constitutional Court will be weakened under the new Constitution. We are working with them on that. Um, and you asked, can Turkey continue as a member? Again, we have to apply the Convention and rule of law, which is that not only that an individual can apply to the European Court, but a state can also uh, file a state complaint against another state. So if, for instance, um, uh, the uh, members of the Council of Europe uh, uh, come to the opinion that another member state is not in compliance with the convention, they can launch such a uh, state complaint. But, the, of course, it has to be based on the articles in the convention. We have examples on that from, from the past. And again, the court will have a say whether this member state in, in question 
is in compliance with the articles in the Convention. If there is a massive breach of the Convention, of course, uh, which um, the, um, the, the, the European Court has made judgments on, then uh, one can draw the conclusion. But I cannot do it. The only source that can do it is the European uh, Court. Um, will judgment from the European Court be uh, implemented in Turkey? They have always done it. Of course, there are uh, there are uh, delays. Member states use a lot of time on certain uh, judgments, but there is an obligation to implement every judgment from the court. And there are so many examples from the European Court which has helped people in prison in Turkey. They have been released. By the way, the journalist Shan Dündar was released because the Constitutional Court in Turkey referred to the European Court of Human Rights case law. And, and um, there are many other examples. By the way, the other day now, uh, the famous journalist Akhmet Sik was released by the Constitutional Court because the court referred to the case of the European Court. Uh, so you see the system is functioning, but it, it goes quite slow, but not more slowly than uh, proceedings in the domestic courts Europe-wide. Um, has anybody asked for meetings with the um, people in jail and mayors and so on? Yes, indeed. The European Commissioner, uh, the Commissioner for Human Rights has done it. The CPT has visited the prisoners. I have to be very cautious because I cannot, so to say, um, intervene in uh, proceedings in our own court. But for instance, I, met, I mentioned Ahmed Sikh when he was put in jail five years ago uh, for uh, writing the book in which he, um, he um, uh, outlined how the Gulenists were, in the, were um, taking over the, the Turkish state. And he was put in jail. And then I sent my own special representative to speak with him. And after that, I said to Erdogan, look, he has, uh, he has explained to you how, uh, what the danger is, uh, namely that uh, the Turkish state is being infiltrated by the Gulenists, so he, he should be released, and he was released. But he went to the hill afterwards again, but now was released by the Constitutional Court. So yes, we, do, we, we intervene, but we cannot uh, intervene in proceedings in our own court. That uh, we have to be very cautious on uh, that. Uh, so I have s you um, ask about uh, my impression on uh, the role of the con Constitutional Court. Well, let me put it like this: I spoke to an, uh, an audience of some 500. Uh, judges, prosecutors, and um, also many, many young uh, candidates for becoming uh, judges in Turkey. Uh, and I gave the clear message, respect the Constitutional Court, otherwise the Europe, all the applications will land in the European Court of Human Rights, and it is better for Turkey to apply the convention at the domestic level rather than an international court takes over. I think that this message got through and the other day now uh, President Erdogan said in a public statement that yes, we um, had the right to criticize of a court, but we will always implement the judgments of the court. This was said by him. I hope it will be applied. Um, but it remains to be seen. If not, as I've said many times, the European Court of Human Rights will take over. Uh, well, uh, you also asked about um, um, whether we are afraid that the European Union contribution to the Council of Europe may decrease if or when the United Kingdom leaves. Uh, we haven't got any signals. Um, we are coping with our own 
with our own financial problems now because uh, Turkey has re uh, reduced its contribution to the budget. And we do not, we, we really hope that um, we do not get new surprises from our partner in the European Union. But, but, but of course, I understand that uh, also EU are, is facing a challenge with regard to financing all the activities after uh, United Kingdom has uh, left. Um, the question from the lady from uh, United Kingdom. Well, this uh, Salisbury affair seems to be very bad, I would say. But again, it's not for the time being a matter for the Council of Europe. But the people affected, if they survive, can of course make complaints to our court. Uh, you asked about um, uh, individual rights in uh, Russian Federation. We are, as you are, concerned with some of the laws, for instance, the law on NGOs and foreign agents, and also the law related to LGBT ICE people, uh, in particular the one that is banning so-called propaganda for homosexuality. What I can say, again, here of a court will play a role because these two laws have been, um, the individuals have complained to the court because of these laws and the over court will then hand down the judge, judgments whether these laws are in compliance with the European Convention. Uh, so again, um, uh, there will be adjustments on this from over court, and then the Russian Federation is obliged to change the laws. Uh, my last point would be to, see, to say to Mr. Weigel, I am, as you are, very concerned with the developments in the world at large, more and more um, we see more and more violation of international law, of international treaties, and uh, there are um, uh, continuous uh, discussions about the role of the European, con European Court. It, it is being challenged by many political forces uh, around Europe, so I am very worried what we can do is, of course, to have dialogue with our member states, with the parties in our member states, the parliaments, the governments, and um, it is Im very important in that respect that we ourselves apply the law. A difficulty, and I will end up with this, Mr. President, a difficulty, difficulty that we see is that everybody wants to be a court now. Everybody wants to have a say and say this person's, person in, uh, in Turkey is guilty, this, is, uh, this person is innocent, so one wants to be uh, its own court. We have to say that we have only one court that has the final word, and that is the uh, European Court of Human Rights. That's why I cannot be a judge on whether this person in Turkey is innocent or not. I cannot uh, intervene in these cases in Turkey directly. What I can do is to apply uh, the convention and ask over court to have the final word, and that must be really the final word. Otherwise, it's not a court. The, final, the, the judgment of a court has to be the final word. Uh, and we have to respect it, otherwise uh, it goes very wrong with the whole convention system, which was set up after the Second World War. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for asking, for answering all our questions. I guess there are no further comments. We're already running slightly late. Then, thank you so much for coming. Looking forward to having you as a guest speaker again in our committee, and look for you. Good luck for your work. So, somebody take care.
So now is Mrs. Sikov Manyi? She's already here. Do you want to sit here in front or you want to remain there? Yeah, come here. Why not? And Mr. Kobolyev? Is he here? There you are. Welcome. Now, shall I guess sit here or I think it's better? Yeah, please, come in front. And Darius, would you like to sit next? So we come to the next point on our agenda, exchange of views on the crisis situation and gas supplies to Ukraine. Um, I have decided to put this topic as one of the points on our agenda at the request of some of our members and due to the sudden developments in Ukraine in the last days. We were today are also a member of the EU-Ukraine Parliamentary Association Committee and its chair, Mr. Dario Sozati. Welcome. Um, I won't make many introductory remarks, just that, of course, all of you know that on the 1st of March, Gazprom decided to stop supplying prepaid gas to Ukraine, as well as to withdraw from a contract with Naftogaz, the national oil and gas company of Ukraine. This is yet another proof of instrumentalizing gas supplies as a political tool of pressure by the government in Moscow. Many of us are deeply concerned as this move does not only impact Ukrainian but also our EU energy security. The Commission has declared its availability to play a mediating role. It has called on all parties to agree to start as early as possible trilateral consultations in the EU-Ukraine-Russia format and to participate in good faith in these discussions with a view to overcoming this tense situation. I guess we all welcome and support this. We have invited representatives of the European Commission and from Ukraine to update us with the situation and possible solutions. Um, these are, I would like to give you a warm welcome. On the one hand, Mrs. Katarina sikov manyi is that the correct pronunciation? She's the head of unit in the DG ENA, which is the DG responsible for the energy union portfolio. And then we also would like to welcome Mr. Andrei Kobulyev, the CEO of Naftogaz from Ukraine. So that's all from my side. Would Darius Rosati like to say a few words as chairman of the EU, EP Ukraine delegation, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, dear colleagues, indeed, uh, we've been witnessing a very uh, uh, unprecedented uh, situation uh, in the wake of the ruling of the arbitration court in Stockholm uh, the Russian company Gazprom has announced that it would uh, stop supplying uh, gas to Ukraine uh, and uh, also terminate all the contracts uh, for deliveries of gas that have been prepaid by Ukraine. This is unprecedented uh, simply because uh, this action, this decision, has nothing to do with the ruling of the court and it's a blatant violation of international obligations uh, under contractual arrangement uh, signed by, uh, by Gazprom. This has put Ukraine in a very dire situation. And this, uh, is a, if I may say so, has been a deliberate attempt by Gazprom to destabilize the situation in Ukraine. Gazprom has dem declared that uh, supplies to the European Union will continue uh, without any problem. <clears throat> but this is, as we can see, an attempt to put uh, Ukraine into the corner against the wall uh, because uh, uh, Gazprom probably hopes that Ukraine would uh, start uh, stealing some gas supplies going to Europe 
<coughs> being deprived of their own uh, supplies. That's why I, I commend the Ukrainian authorities that they have reacted with uh, restraint to this situation and they have immediately established contact with the European uh, Commission and with the European Union in order to coordinate <coughs> their uh, reactions vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis this, this situation. Uh, I, I think that uh, this is once again, as you, Mr. Chairman, has indicated, once again an instance in which Russia has been using the gas supply as a political weapon, as an instrument of coercion, as an instrument of political pressure on countries that have been <coughs> imprudent enough to, uh, to import gas from this unreliable partner. Uh, I think uh, there is a need for a strong reaction on our side, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, we cannot simply uh, sit back and uh, watch the situation unfolding when we have uh, a, a case of uh, violation of international law again and we have a case of putting a pressure on an independent country, which is Ukraine, <coughs> uh, and uh, uh, the country that has been uh, in the past also affected by uh, an armed conflict in the uh, eastern regions, as you all know. Uh, Ukraine has, uh, have had, has had to take uh, emergency decisions, cutting gas supplies to some important segments of its economy, and this uh, because of uh, the fact that Russia didn't care about even warning early about these uh, uh, supply, supply uh, uh, cuts, we of course, I'm sorry, we of course cannot simply tolerate the situation. So my <coughs> opinion is that we have to have a serious look uh, on the situation in, the, in its uh, entirety, especially as far as so gas uh, security supplies, uh, gas supply security uh, is concerned. We have to admit that Russia is not a reliable partner. This is uh, a country that uh, has uh, continuously resorted to using uh, gas as a political weapon. I think in the context of this situation also the plans to build Nord Stream 2 have to be at least reconsidered, if not abandoned, straightforward, simply because we cannot and we should not increase our dependence on one particular supplier, which is not trustworthy. And uh, we have, at the same time, uh, taken a, a, a decisive stance in this situation in order to <coughs> uh, uh, convey a, a strong message to Russia that this kind of behavior is simply unthinkable. And we cannot simply have normal relations with Russia in a situation when the gas monopolies behave in such a way. So I would call on the members of this distinguished committee to uh, demonstrate resolve and decisiveness in this uh, very difficult situation. We cannot simply tolerate behavior of this type. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dario Sozati. And I would now like to give the floor first to Ms. Sikov Manyi for a brief introduction, and then we will have an exchange of views with Mr. Kobulev. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good evening, honorary members. Um, from the Commission side, uh, we were informed immediately on the 1st of March about the situation and Gazprom's refusal to deliver the already ordered and prepaid gas to Naftogaz. Um, and as was already pointed out, this uh, refusal followed the second Stockholm Arbitration Award issued on 28 February, and this award required Gazprom to pay a net of US dollars of 2.6 billion uh, as compensation to Naftogaz for transit contract violation. These, the missing, missing gas volumes, together with the low temperatures in the first days of January, created certain threats to the stability of the Ukrainian gas system and emergency measures were uh, necessary to tackle the situation. The Commission responded to the situation immediately. Firstly, Vice President Sevcovic held bilateral consultations with Ukrainian Prime Minister uh, Groisman, with Naftogaz CEO Mr. Kobolev and Russia's Energy Minister Novak. Uh, in parallel, 
bilateral technical uh, consultations took place between Commission services and the counterparts in Ukraine. And thirdly, ongoing dialogue is in place and information exchange uh, continues to clarify some technical aspects uh, of this situation and also to draw lessons uh, for the future. Both Russia and Ukraine uh, assured the Commission that the gas transit to the EU uh, is safeguarded and not under any threat. Uh, Ukraine took several demand side measures uh, to address the situation, including, for instance, switching to alternative fuel supplies, closing down public buildings, asking the society citizens uh, to lower the heating temperatures at home, uh, in, etc. Ukraine also purchased the missing gas volumes through Poland, uh, thanks to the existing reverse flow infrastructure between the two countries. Uh, the situation was stabilized on 5th of March, uh, and the emergency measures that were reported uh, in Ukraine were withdrawn. Public buildings, including schools notably, were reopened. So, secondly, uh, following the second Stockholm Arbitration Award, Gazprom also announced its intention and commenced to seek termination of both gas supply and transit contracts with Naftogaz. The termination of both contracts is likely to be a lengthy process. However, we expect it to take place in an orderly manner, taking into account the rights and obligations of both sides and also the impact on third parties uh, such as the EU. The Commission expects to be fully informed about the next steps in this process uh, by both sides. Vice President Sevcovic reiterated the Commission's readiness to mediate uh, in eventual talks if need be. Furthermore, we expect both sides to fully respect their Stockholm Arbitration Awards and the respective obligations re resulting from these awards. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Kobolev. Once again, welcome from Kiev. Good evening and thank you for this opportunity to speak uh, in European Parliament. Uh, I have prepared a small presentation to discuss events of March 2018, uh, which we call the third episode of the Russia's gas wars. We already had two episodes in 2006 and in 2009 which created significant damage to both um, Ukrainian gas market and overall gas industry in Europe because that uh, significantly undermined trust of consumers in gas as a reliable fuel free from political influence. Uh, before I start my presentation, I would like to express my uh, um, consent with uh, ideas proposed by Mr. Razati about what has happened. Uh, it is uh, pretty much correct uh, uh, and, uh, I would say, very uh, specific assessment of situation. Uh, I also uh, would like to go back a bit in the past uh, to uh, describe uh, what was preceding situation in March 2018. May I please have a next slide? And one more slide. Uh, in the end of 2017, uh, Gazprom and Naftigas finished the first uh, arbitration case in Stockholm. Uh, just to remind you, the arbitration was initiated by Gazprom itself in 2014 when trilateral negotiations uh, supervised by European Commission with the help of Mr. Oettinger, the uh, um, European Commission at that time responsible for energy, failed to achieve any consensus between the parties. Uh, to cut the long story short, uh, the major elements uh, of the decision was that the price was significantly reduced. So Stockholm found that the price Gazprom was attempting to charge Ukraine was too high. Uh, all take a pay claims in the amount of 56 billion US dollars were declared null and void by tribunal. And for looking further, 
tribunal established new volumes which uh, Gazprom is obliged to supply to Naftogaz and Naftogaz is obliged to offtake. Uh, why I'm mentioning these specific uh, elements? Because um, from what we see so far, Gazprom did not contest that decision, except for one element. They don't agree that the previous take or pay payments um, can be cancelled. New price, new volumes, new terms of uh, buying gas are not being contested by Gazprom. Uh, what happened next? Can we please have a look at the next slide? For the last two months, uh, in January and February 2018, Naftogaz and Gazprom were negotiating on resumption of gas supply because two or even three winters before uh, Naftogaz was not buying gas from Gazprom because of the dispute, we were taking all the gas we needed from European direction. However, understanding that we have an obligation to buy uh, we as a party acting in good faith uh, have started negotiation in order to be compliant with both new amended contract uh, and our obligation. Uh, Gazprom uh, accepted the new terms and conditions of gas supply and the formal evidence of that acceptance is very simple. They issued a new invoice based on new price and new volume. And that invoice was received by Naftogaz in February and that invoice was fully paid in February in accordance with the contract. The amount was 127 million US dollars. It's not that important for our discussion, but still the substantial amount of funds uh, which were transferred from Naftogaz to Gazprom. Uh, there was another element of potential new cooperation which was discussed is that uh, in terms of convenience for both parties, we were discussing option to sign a new addendum because we have old contract and we have tribunal decision. Decision is something like 800 pages which makes it quite difficult for different control agencies to explain why we are paying money, how gas is being supplied. So that discussion around that addendum took place in February, however addendum was not signed. But both parties acknowledged in negotiations, especially Gazprom, that there is no need to sign any addendum if invoice is issued and is paid, then gas should be supplied. Uh, what happened uh, later on, may I please have the next slide, is that on 28th February 2018, just one day before the supply of gas to Ukraine should be started by Gazprom, we received decision on the second case, transit case. Uh, in this decision, uh, Naftogaz managed to win substantial amount of funds, specifically 4.6 billion US dollars for gas or for underdelivered volumes of gas through transit pipeline system, which Gazprom committed to deliver in the contract, but failed to do so. The net difference which Gazprom now owes to Naftogaz between all other gas supplies which were not paid by that time. And this award is 2.6 billion US dollars. That's something Gazprom owes Naftogaz right now and is obliged to pay immediately after uh, award came into effect. Uh, just to give you a brief idea, the basis for this award, because I know there have been some speculations in Russian media saying that it's a fair decision, it's a political based decision, uh, it's not symmetrical compared to take a pay decision. Uh, the next slide will demonstrate why it was taken. It's very simple. If you look at the yellow line, that's the daily volume of gas transit sent through Ukrainian system in the direction of Uzhgorod. Basically, this is the line which goes directly to Western Europe, to Germany, Austria, and other countries. And you can see how that capacity is being utilized. The uh, dark blue line is North Stream utilization, and light blue line is Yamal pipeline utilization. Oh yes, from point of view of absolute volume, our system is underutilized. But in certain periods of time, when there is demand for Russian gas, our system in being is a balancing option. So decision of Stockholm Tribunal was based on a very simple approach. 
uh, comparing it to everyday life outside gas business, if you rent an apartment but you don't live there 31 days in a month, but let's say 15 or 20, you still have to pay for the full month. That's the difference between ship pay concept and difference between take or pay concept, which from our point of view in Naftogaz gas is quite obvious. Next slide, please. What happened on the 1st of uh, March was uh, partly described before, uh, but I would like to stress uh, a very important uh, element, uh, is that uh, not only Gazprom did not deliver the gas on the 1st of February, as they should be delivering, they informed us that they are returning money and not sending gas 15 minutes before delivery should be starting. However, the money was re received significantly more time before several days. And they also lowered pressure in the gas pipeline system on the entrance to Ukraine from Russia by more than 20%. Lowering pressure to I mean, 20% from the minimum wo uh, le level of pressure required by existing transit contract. Level pressure creates significant risk of our system being not capable to deliver all molecules of gas in full amount within one day through transit pipeline. Uh, next slide, please. What Gazprom did from legal assessment? They violated both transit and supply contracts. They violated arbitration tribunal awards, and they violated common European business practices. And I fully share option, opinion that this violation was done deliberately in the middle of very cold spell of weather, which was then the case in both Western Europe and Ukraine, which made situation so difficult to handle in Ukrainian side. Average temperature on those days in Ukraine was lower than minus 16 degrees by Celsius. In some regions, it was minus 25. Gas supply was quite critical to maintain in heats in the houses of Ukrainian people and to maintain industrial uh, production. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, response from Ukrainian side was discussed again by Mr. Rosati, but I would like to point out that uh, the PR campaign that was launched by Ukrainian government present Naftogaz was very successful. We achieved unprecedented cut, I would say deliberate and voluntary cut by our consumers of gas consumption in big cities by 14% on daily comparison, which uh, I must say even I didn't expect to happen. And that big cut was a very powerful sign to Gazprom that they cannot use gas as a weapon and that people of Ukraine are prepared to retaliate. Next slide, please. Um, I believe it's very important understanding all the facts which have been presented so far, and I welcome more questions and comments on this, uh, to do one thing which unfortunately was not done in 2006 and in 2009. And speaking simply, the thing is very simple, is to call things the way they are. Gazprom attempted to create an artificial gas crisis, and the ultimate goal of this crisis was to promote Nord Stream 2. Uh, the attempt failed. However, it would be very important to build factual evidence for future discussions about the role of gas in geopolitics, about circumventing pipelines, about what to do with Ukrainian transit, to give a very direct and blunt assessment of this situation. Who did what and whose fault was that? that the crisis almost took place. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Kobolyev, for your brief presentation. Colleagues, I had pointed out that we have a few difficulties with the translation. Um, provided uh, we will only have the translations a few more minutes. Um, if we continue our meeting, we will just have to do it in English. And we definitely have to close this meeting at 21.25 sharp. So we have about 25 minutes now for an exchange of views. And let's give the floor to the speakers according to the group lines. We start, of course, with Michael Gala for the EPP.
Well, thank you very much uh, also for the details once again to, to uh, see how uh, things uh, happened. Um, well, my political assessment is uh, very much in line with what uh, colleague Rosati said. We see yet another example of instrumentalizing uh, the gas monopolist for political purposes. I think uh, there is no doubt about that and probably the purpose is definitely to tell uh, Western consumers, well, wouldn't it be nice to have Nord Stream 2? Then we can avoid all that. Uh, and uh, I think, um, well, that is uh, where we stand. Um, my my uh, question uh, is about a more uh, about a technical nature. Uh, this uh, reverse f flow is it only going through? I heard about uh, Poland was delivering it currently. Uh, but also the Ushkorod way was, was mentioned, that goes then more to Hungary or to Slovakia. Uh, is the reverse flow also going from Slovakia? And um, simply price-wise, um, uh, now they have the Russians sent back the, the 127 million, can you now pay this reverse flow? Is that the technical way to do it now? Instead of paying to Gazprom the 127 million, you pay it uh, for the same price to those who deliver to you the reverse flow? Is that the arrangement, how it works? And um, uh, what, uh, and uh, for, for me, uh, of course, uh, the question is how long could we, and that is more than to the Commission perhaps, uh, uh, how long could we sustain such a, uh, such a reverse flow? Uh, and at what price, well, how, what do we expect? And, uh, is there not a very concrete uh, uh, well, um, discussion or uh, attempt to, to get uh, into contact directly with the Russian government? I mean, formally it's Gazprom, but we all know who is behind. What is the actual political reaction in public uh, towards Russia? I think there should be a clear signal. I mean, today we prolonged the sanctions again uh, for another six months, which is good. But that is another, uh, that is not directly because of that. Uh, so please, uh, what are the planned reactions? Thank you. Thank you, Michael Gala, and now Claire Moody. Yeah, simply very briefly following on from the, uh, the comments that have already been made. Firstly, thank you for coming to the committee this evening and uh, talking through the situation as clearly as you have done. Um, the obvious Consequences of this, it's a deeply disturbing situation that uh, we've seen over, well, over the last few days, but it's not the first time we've seen this situation, and uh, consequently it clearly does require greater investigation and also looking at in more detail where, you know, what the, the longer-term consequences will be as well on this, uh, on this circumstance with the, the transmission point as well. So... Once again, thank you for coming and uh, for the points that have been very well made and I look forward to the responses to, uh, to this debate as well. Thank you, Claire Moody. There's nobody from the ECR who wants to speak. Alda, Ivo Weigel, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to say that, of course, what we heard now from from, from the representative of, of the biggest uh, company which is supplying the people of, of, of Ukraine. And uh, we all remember these last months where the Siberian temperatures were reaching uh, not only Ukraine but also uh, the south of, of, of uh, Europe. So it is no doubt about that we have to show solidarity and I think we should also make it not a technical uh, problem but a political problem and and I think that European Union has to react uh, not just a daily routine but with the, with the all uh, 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 authority we might have left when we are speaking to Russia and to Russian leadership eh? So this is my reaction, uh, a human reaction. But of course, I would have a question to you. Uh, 
uh, about you have to solve the problem with, with the Russian counterpart. You have to find a way to, to negotiate, to continue negotiations with them because the commodity somebody has and the other it needs it is always lead to the, to the political pressures and uh, using the, the commodity as a weapon, as you said. So you cannot, uh, you cannot expect that Russia will, will uh, s stop uh, using it as long we did not have a, a valid alternative as Ukraine has no, no valid al alternative. So I think it is important to, to continue talking to them bringing them to the courts, to the international courts, if the, the agreements are not honored, if the, 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 the agreements are violated. Uh, but you will have to, to continue speaking to Russians. They are your neighbors. There is no other way. Thank you. Thank you, Ivo Weigel, for the GUI group. Helmut Scholz, bitte. Thank you, Chair, and I also want to thank for the information and the concrete details you had delivered to us. Uh, just to be uh, clear, I would ask to also to the Commission, because I remember that 10 days ago, uh, Commissioner and Vice President of the Commission, Shevchevich, uh, has informed that he is looking optimistic into the solution of this um, dispute. Uh, so what are the next steps for coming out of the situation you described very well we are in. So what is the, 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 the strategy of the Commission to find a negotiation process with both uh, partners in this dispute? And second question also to, the, um, to our Ukrainian um, guest uh, concerning what is the strategy of your enterprise for finding a, a solution? For, for negotiating, or do you hope that with the non-recognition um, of the accord uh, by Gazprom, we are in a, in a certain deadline? So uh, what, what are the next steps you have foreseen? Thank you. Thank you, Helmut Scholz. For the Greens, nobody wants to take the floor for the EFDD, no one. So our final speaker is then Mr. Schaffhauser for the ENF Group. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Différentes remarques brèves. Ma première remarque, c'est que lorsqu'on veut juger d'une situation, il faut entendre les deux parties, euh, aussi bien Nafdogaz, et je remercie euh, l'exposé qui a été fait, mais aussi Gazprom. Si nous voulons nous transformer en cours, il faudrait encore que, effectivement, nous puissions faire un procès juste. Ce que je retiens, c'est que euh, la Russie veut limiter le transit, et d'autre part, Gazprom commande en réaction moins de gaz. Qu'est-ce qui a été fait Le tribunal. Le tribunal qui a d'ailleurs condamné Gazprom à payer 2,56 milliards. Donc il y a des cours de justice pour ce genre d'affaires et je ne vois pas que la Russie a abusé de la force, comme cela a été dit par mon collègue, parce que quand même en 2014 et le départ de Yanukovych et des accords signés, ce n'est pas dû du fait russe. Ma deuxième réflexion, c'est notre dépendance du gaz russe. La Commission se donnait comme objectif de moins dépendre du gaz russe. Je constate que nous dépendons de plus en plus du gaz russe, ce qui d'ailleurs était prévisible, et que le marché spot n'est pas capable de faire face, face à une situation extrême de grand froid. Ma troisième réflexion, ma quatrième réflexion, je m'excuse, concerne Nord Stream. Qu'un certain nombre de pays, dont l'Allemagne, dont la France aussi, veuillent se protéger pour être sûrs de leur approvisionnement, eh bien, si j'étais à leur place, je ferais exactement la même chose dans une situation pareille. Et je constate néanmoins qu'il n'y a pas là-dessus un point de vue européen pour assurer la sécurité, quelles que soient les conditions de notre approvisionnement. Ma cinquième réflexion, et pour finir, c'est le citoyen qui perd, qui paye et qui paie. Aussi bien le citoyen ukrainien qui a vu son énergie augmenter de 9,5 fois le prix, si mes chiffres sont exacts, 
et d'autre part les citoyens qui payent de plus en plus cher leur gaz depuis 2013 et cette politique absurde de la Commission européenne. Merci. Monsieur Schaffhauser, we no longer have interpretation now. So, a final round. Who would start? Who would like to start? Ladies first. Thank you. Um, the EU system, EU gas, gas grid, gas market has been uh, developed in the past years and it begins to be very resilient to be able to sustain a supply shock wherever it uh, could come from. We are still not fully there, but uh, we are very, very well uh, placed in many parts. And the reverse flow possibilities, uh, be it then from Poland towards Ukraine or be it from Slovakia towards Ukraine, are already a good demonstration of uh, that the market uh, begins to be resilient to help also our neighbors. Uh, we are currently working also on reversing the flow on the uh, Trans-Balkan uh, pipeline, which, would, which now goes from Ukraine till uh, uh, Greece and to Turkey. So the gas grid begins to be, is very resilient today. It's, you know, we are very different position than we were in 2006 uh, or 2009. Uh, but of course, Russia is an important uh, supplier to the EU. Uh, in terms of gas and a very long uh, disruption would of course have its impact. Um, on the next steps, uh, Commission Vice President, as I said, is in uh, regular contact uh, with his counterparts at the political level, be it in Ukraine or in Russia. Uh, he has offered to uh, facilitate discussions with the two parties at all levels, be it political level or technical level. Uh, a trilateral meeting has not yet been fixed, uh, but we believe that it will be fixed quite soon after the elections uh, in, in Russia. So therefore, we remain uh, at this moment working at the technical level with the counterparts, uh, and we are preparing the ground for also political discussions uh, as a next step on the issue. And therefore, uh, Vice President Sevcovic's optimism uh, is uh, there uh, on these matters. I think those were the two questions addressed to the Commission. Thank you. Thank you. And for a final round, Mr. Kobolyev. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I don't uh, speak French and I couldn't understand the last remarks. Yes, there was no translation. Colleagues, I try, to, I try to explain to members of this committee that there will only be translation till nine o'clock. The thing is that colleagues insist on having these meetings at late hours, but these are the consequences. I apologize, but we can explain to you later on what okay. Mr. Schaffhauser was saying. Okay, thank you. Um, Speaking of uh, reverse uh, routes and supply from the 1st of March to Ukraine, uh, yes, uh, we are utilizing all three routes. Uh, Polish route was the first uh, on the 1st of uh, uh, March to increase gas supply to Ukraine, not by a big amount, but it was important for us to maintain the pressure in the system. Now the major route is Slovakia, as was the case for the last three winters. So we are getting major amount of gas through Slovakia. The second big route is Hungary, and the third is Polish route. The Romanian route uh, is still being blocked by Gazprom, uh, who are not uh, willing to allow Romanian transgas to utilize virtual reverse flow as the only way to get gas for Ukraine from Romanian direction at this point of time. Uh, we are paying to European uh, suppliers of gas. Again, we know how to do this. That's a not new task for us. Uh, moreover, all overpayments in terms of prices uh, which Naftogaz will incur will be charged to Gazprom as damages under one of the clauses of the contract. They will have to compensate for this. 
Um, and uh, um, speaking of contacts with Russian government, uh, I must say that um, Russian government uh, usually is willing to talk to both us and from what we know to European Commission. However, Gazprom itself for the last two years was not showing up for any proposal to have trilateral discussion on gas matters to European Commission. And um, my assessment of this situation, and uh, there was a proposal to speak to Gazprom and to Russians, they are our neighbors. Um, I've been in Nafta Gas since 2002, and I was responsible for Gazprom negotiations since 2006. Uh, the mechanics of decisions uh, in that part of the world is very simple. Uh, they are measuring uh, benefits and risks, and that's how Gazprom is acting. The major problem in relationships with gas with Europe, which we see from Ukrainian side, that's our opinion, our assessment. Gazprom does not see any credible threats. That's the first problem. Let's mention antitrust investigation which was launched by European Commission 2008-2010. Now it's 2018, and there is still no outcome. So Gazprom does whatever they like. They understand there are no consequences. And within their logic, if you can try to push the system harder and the system does not react back, then why not to try? That's what they're doing every time. It's very simple. Um, another issue here is that they are very efficient in applying divide and conquer approach. There is no single point of discussion between Russia and European Union. They are building different streams trying to convince separate countries that this stream should be implemented. Then they don't want to talk to European Commission, then it changes vice versa. There should be a single voice, a single approach from European Union, and then it's going to be much easier to talk to Gazprom. Otherwise, they find their way of trying to manipulate these differences and manipulate current position in the European Union is something which gives them an option to extract either more profits and to gain political benefits. Um, speaking of uh, further discussions, uh, we've been suggested a meeting by Gazprom bilateral one again. They don't want to meet with the European Commission. Uh, acting within the contract and within customer practice, we have no, and I don't see any point in refusing and we will meet with them. That will happen by the end of the month. Uh, and uh, I also understand that until the end uh, of uh, this um, last run for political, uh, not political, but for uh, let's call it since the way they are, of re-election of Mr. Putin, uh, which should happen somewhere on March 18, 19, as far as I remember, is going to be very difficult to talk to Russians from a political perspective. That, those are all remarks I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions, remarks? That is not the case, but I would like to thank our guest speaker from DG Energy and also our guest speaker from Kiev. Um, I will now close the meeting before just asking if there's any other business. And our next meetings will be on the 19th and 20th of March in Brussels. Thank you and have a wonderful evening in Strasbourg. <laughs>